Okay, I'm just going to introduce you and then we'll take it from there. Okay, no. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for signing up for Aquatic Sciences Grand Rounds. I think we've had uh, some great speakers and uh, now it's time for one of our own great speakers and Dr. Fine. Everybody knows Dr. Fine. He uh, <clears throat> is a heart failure cardiologist and echocardiographist. Uh, he obtained his MD from uh, and uh, did his internal medicine and cardiology at Western, same place where I did uh, some of my training. So no wonder he's good. So he went on and completed a fellowship in echocardiography and heart failure, as well as clinical research at the Mayo Clinic. And he also obtained a master's of science in epidemiology from Harvard School of Public Health in Boston. He's currently an assistant clinical professor of clinical at the Department of Cardiac Sciences and Community Health Sciences at our coming School of Medicine here in Calgary. He's the current clinical director of the Levin Cardiovascular Institute, and he is the director of the Clinical and Research Core Echocardiography Laboratories. He's co-lead of Heart Rate Failure Research Program, and he's done a significant clinical and has a research interest in heart failure and infiltrative cardiomyopathies, which he's going to be uh, uh, discussing today. He's also led the Canadian uh, Registry for Amyloidosis Research and Anderson Fabry Disease. He's very active within our division, and uh, he also has uh, over 50 publications uh, in the recent few years. He's supported by the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada as an early career researcher, and it's a great pleasure to have Noel here with us today. Noel. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos, uh, for the introduction and uh, for having me and uh, giving me the opportunity to give an update on, on cardiac amyloidosis. Uh, I thought it'd be a nice time to give an update. There's actually been a lot going on in the last, well, there's been a lot going on in the last five years. It's really been quite a dramatic uh, shift in an evolution of, of practice and care, but even in the last year, uh, even with COVID going on, there's there's been a lot to uh, to talk about. So I thought I'd take the opportunity. I hope everyone is well and, and safe out there. Um, I've gotten into the habit of showing a picture uh, of the Peace Bridge uh, across our beautiful uh, Bow River in Calgary. Um, because it, it, it struck me that uh, this structure kind of looks like an an amyloid fibril, actually, uh, and uh, perhaps its, uh, its structural integrity and strength was uh, part of its design. Of course, then the interventional cardiologists are very quick to point out that it, it looks more like a stent, um, to which I say, uh, touche, you know, who knew that stents were modeled after amyloid fibrils? And we go back and forth playing amyloid stent uh, tennis. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll go on and give an update. Uh, here are my disclosures. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, I'll give some background and some uh, general information uh, about amyloid, uh, its pathophysiology and subtypes, and a little bit about the epidemiology, although there's still a lot we don't know about all of those things. Um, probably the main part of the talk will be uh, focusing on the new Canadian guidelines that were published earlier this year in the CJC. Uh, in particular, talking about diagnostic testing strategies uh, and red flag symptoms, uh, and also reviewing uh, current management approaches. Um, and uh, uh, then we'll go on a little bit to discuss some uh, local and some national initiatives uh, and uh, what's going on in the world of amyloidosis in Canada and beyond. Okay, so to start with, um, oh, we've got some. <laughs> some information, some more information about the bridge. So that's very helpful. That's that's part I didn't know. I'll have to uh, look up uh, that uh, architect uh, as well. Um, yeah, so, but we're starting off with uh, pathophysiology. So uh, first things first, um, what is amyloidosis? Amyloidosis uh, is not an easy area to, to get to know initially because it's a very large and heterogeneous group of disorders. It's not just one disease, it's dozens of diseases, in fact. Uh, but they all share one thing, and that's uh, that they have extracellular deposition of insoluble fibrils um, in the tissues of different organ systems. 
Uh, and those fibrils are made up of misfolded precursor proteins, uh, endogenous proteins. And really it's, it's the protein, uh, the precursor protein that defines uh, the type of amyloidosis and, and how it behaves. Um, it's mostly a systemic disease or group of systemic diseases. There are localized types, um, but they're generally rare. And usually it has a predominance for one or two organ systems, uh, although certainly uh, many can be affected on any one patient. The two main types that we think about uh, in the cardiac world are light chain amyloidosis uh, and transthyretin amyloidosis. Uh, and they both have a kind of a common end phenotype of, of a thick heart, thick and stiff heart. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, about both types in just a minute. So yeah, so light chain amyloidosis, uh, for many years, this was really what people thought most about when they talked about cardiac amyloidosis. Uh, this is a malignant hematologic disorder. It's a plasma cell dyscrasia. And essentially what happens is you get a clonal proliferation of rogue plasma cells, these antibody producing uh, B cells, which are an important part of our immune system. Uh, and they begin to crank out these antibodies, but they're not normal antibodies. Uh, in fact, they're not even full antibodies. They're just fragments of antibodies, the light chain fragments. Uh, and they don't really do anything except get, get all stuck together uh, and then lodge into tissues uh, like the heart uh, where they, and the kidneys where they cause problems. Um, it's very closely related to multiple myeloma and this can be a source of confusion. Uh, multiple myeloma also has a clonal proliferation of plasma cells. Uh, the main difference is that you just get a lot more of the plasma cells uh, and you don't really get the, the antibody production that you do with, or the light chain antibody production that you do with AL amyloidosis. And so with all of those plasma cells, you get crowding out of the bone marrow and you get complications from that, like anemia and hypercalcemia causing kidney problems. But the two can overlap and that happens in about 10 to 20% uh, of patients where, where they get both. Um, it's particularly bad for the heart because uh, we think that there's a direct toxic effect. So it's not just the infiltrative effect of those light chain fibrils that causes the heart to get stiff, uh, but the light chains actually have a direct toxic effect on the myocytes uh, and damage uh, their function, which is why we see relatively higher troponins uh, in this population. Light chain amyloidosis predominantly affects the kidneys uh, and the majority, most patients will have kidney involvement, but the heart is actually number two. And, and we now know that uh, the majority, over half of patients uh, have cardiac involvement. Uh, and if we were to, we don't know exactly how many, but if we were to biopsy all of them, we would guess around three quarters, in fact, maybe even a bit more. Uh, and it's not so much the, the presence of cardiac involvement that matters the most. Uh, it's, it's the extent of cardiac involvement and, and how bad it is uh, that really influences their management. Transthyretin on amyloidosis, on the other hand, is actually quite a, a different disease in many ways. Um, so uh, it's named for the, pro the precursor protein transthyretin. Uh, which is also known as prealbumin uh, and is used uh, as a nutritional marker uh, in many places. Um, this protein is made by the liver predominantly. Uh, and as per its name, it's a transport protein and it transports thyroxin and retinol binding protein uh, throughout the circulation. Uh, and it is formed as a tetramer, kind of these, this four leaf clover, if you will, uh, and the key step uh, and what makes this kind of very susceptible to amyloidosis is that it, um, it has this tendency to dissociate into monomers and those monomers like to get stuck together uh, and congregate as amyloid fibrils uh, and get stuck in tissues like the heart uh, and predominantly the nerves. And so that dissociation is kind of the key rate limiting step uh, in amyloid, um, in the amyloid pathologic uh, cascade. There's two subtypes of transthyretin amyloidosis, just to make it more complicated. So there's the hereditary type, uh, which is actually quite rare in Canada. Uh, I've got maybe 15 to 20 patients uh, who have this. Um, it's very prevalent in certain endemic areas, uh, areas like Portugal and South America as a result. 
um, Sweden, uh, Japan, and, and some Asian countries, uh, and a few other areas. Um, and it predominantly causes either a cardiomyopathy uh, or a peripheral neuropathy uh, or both. The wild type, on the other hand, uh, is an age-related disorder uh, where there's no gene mutation, uh, most common in men, 80 to 90% of patients are men. Um, and uh, it used to be known as systemic senile amyloidosis, although we don't call it that anymore. Uh, and it predominantly causes a uh, cardiomyopathy, that's its main uh, manifestation, um, except uh, that we do know that uh, there is some neurologic involvement that can happen as well. So this is a, a figure from uh, a review written by Claudio Rapetzi uh, in Italy, who's uh, kind of a famous cardiologist in amyloid world, has done a lot of pioneering work. Um, and this uh, figure likes, is, illustrates the, uh, the spectrum of uh, phenotypic presentations between neurologic on the left and cardiac on the right, and their association with different uh, gene mutations. So on the left, we see uh, some mutations that predominantly cause neuropathy, uh, and probably the, the, the one that's best known is the B30M mutation, particularly early onset. Uh, it's endemic in regions, especially Portugal. Um, and its other name is familial amyloid polyneuropathy, or FAP, although that name is starting to uh, get used less and less. Uh, on the cardiac side, there's a few mutations that are predominantly cardiac. Uh, probably one of the main ones, particularly in North America, is the B122I mutation. Uh, this mutation is very uh, prevalent uh, in people of uh, African and Caribbean descent. Uh, and it's estimated that in, in the U.S. at least, uh, up to 3 to 4% of uh, patients from that um, uh, ethnic group are uh, uh, carriers of this, although the penetrance is, is not well known. But we see, and there's a few other cardiac causing gene mutations, but there's this whole spectrum, and this isn't uh, all of the gene mutations. In fact, there are over a hundred, uh, but there's this whole spectrum of other mutations uh, that we see some type of mix of cardiac and neuro involvement. Uh, and in fact, in my experience, uh, that's the majority of patients, even with these mutations, they have some mix. It's just one tends to predominate over the other. Um, and which, uh, which phenotype they manifest predominantly can be influenced by a lot of things. Genotype, of course, um, but more than that, actually, there's a lot of factors, including uh, their sex, uh, the geographic region they grow up in, uh, there are comorbidities, in fact, uh, and a host of uh, family history, although family history is often a, uh, not as great a predictor of phenotype as you might expect. Uh, so it, it can be a very interesting, but also sometimes maddening disease to try to understand when you have all of these different uh, clinical presentations. And then up there in the top right corner, I kind of said, uh, mentioned the wild type. So the wild type, I really have no idea how prevalent it is. Um, but we're all pretty sure that it's, it's underdiagnosed uh, and that it's, it's out there uh, waiting to be found uh, in more and more patients. Okay, so moving on to clinical manifestations. So yeah, I've, I've kind of described some of the reasons why it can be a challenging disease uh, to diagnose. And I've got our, our frustrated uh, little physician over here. This is what I used to look like before I started uh, looking after amyloid patients uh, with my full head of hair and uh, uh, didn't need glasses. Uh, but um, it's, been a, it's been a fascinating journey all the same. Uh, so yeah, some of the reasons why it's such a challenge is the phenotypic heterogeneity that I just mentioned. And I'll, I'll explore this a little bit further in the next slide, but the signs and symptoms are very nonspecific. Uh, variable mutation penetrance, I mentioned that, and family history may not be helpful. Multiple diagnostic tests, um, and this is uh, a very challenging aspect of disease. There's a lot of different tests you can do, um, and that's confusing. The order to do them in, how to interpret the results, which one to do next. Uh, and so our guideline document has tried to lay that out a little bit clearer. Um, Often multiple subspecialties can get involved uh, once the diagnosis is made. Um, and sometimes there are the specialties that uh, may or may not need to be involved. Uh, and all of these things contribute to uh, a delay in diagnosis, especially for the wild type um, or the ATTR type. 
uh, which tends to be more of a slowly progressive disease, uh, unlike AL, which can progress very quickly uh, and often declares itself in that way. And so the key feature for kind of rare diseases like this is, is to have a high index of suspicion. So yeah, so I mentioned that uh, the guidelines came out uh, earlier this year uh, through the Canadian Cardiovascular Society and the Canadian Heart Failure Society to try to help uh, cardiovascular healthcare providers uh, recognize uh, and also manage this disease, which can be very challenging uh, even once the diagnosis is made to manage uh, effectively. So here's a figure uh, taken from that document. Um, and all this does is list the, the main clinical manifestations, the main cardiac clinical manifestations. So uh, heart failure, uh, mostly biventricular, often with preserved ejection fraction uh, is the main manifestation and, and what most people think about. Uh, atrial fibrillation is extremely common. Um, the majority of patients will get it at some point. Uh, conduction system disease, also very common. Uh, ventricular arrhythmia, uh, which is common, but often not such a problem in most patients and, and is often asymptomatic. Uh, and then there's this association with aortic valve stenosis, particularly the low flow, low gradient type uh, that we see quite often in the wild type ATTR patients, often with preserved ejection fraction. Now, what I like to point out about this is that these are all very common things, right? Uh, I think most of us will see uh, any combination of these things every day uh, when we're seeing patients. Uh, and so it's, it's spotting the ones that have uh, amyloidosis uh, that is the trick uh, and, and uh, requires a deeper look, but uh, makes it, uh, again, challenging to recognize, especially uh, when you're first meeting a patient. And so I like to say, particularly the ATTR again, is that it hides in plain sight. It hides in plain sight as common cardiovascular disorders. And to expand on that a little bit further, there has been a fair amount of research that's been done uh, to uh, demonstrate this. And so, if, for example, HEF-PEF uh, is a common presentation for patients with amyloidosis. Uh, and in fact, uh, one study out of Europe that looked at patients who were over the age of 60, with which most patients uh, with HEF-PEF R, who had increased LV wall thickness, with which many, if not most, HEF-PEF patients do, um, up to 13% of those patients actually had uh, transthyretic amyloidosis. And so if you think that HEF-PEF is the, is the, you know, uh, represents half of all heart failure in the community, which we think it does, uh, this could actually represent uh, a huge um, un unrecognized population of patients uh, with this disease. Another one I mentioned is uh, aortic stenosis. And here's a study also from Europe looking at patients who were referred for TAVR uh, and they just screened them uh, for this disease uh, and found that 16% of them uh, with the low flow, low gradient type of aortic stenosis uh, actually had transthyretin amyloidosis as well. And then here's another study which looked at uh, patients who were followed in a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic and just screened them all and found that actually 5% uh, of those patients uh, had this disease uh, instead uh, and were misdiagnosed, uh, which is a very easy thing to do. And we're gonna be looking at uh, this uh, in our population uh, as well in Calgary. So here's a, a table. This is also in the guideline document. I won't go into this in, in great detail, but I, I put this up here just to illustrate uh, that this is a, a multi-system disease uh, with a lot of different manifestations. Uh, and the extra cardiac manifestations are important uh, because they can help increase the uh, index of suspicion for recognition, um, but they're also complicated uh, and difficult to remember and heavily influenced by the subtype. Uh, probably on this list, the neurologic ones uh, are the most important to, to think about, and I'll uh, expand on that uh, in the next slide. Um, so uh, this just serves to illustrate that there's a lot of things that can happen um, and how challenging it can be uh, if you're looking at slides like this uh, to really remember them uh, and, and apply them in daily clinical practice. And so in recognition of this, the, the guideline panel uh, tried to pare down this list to make it more manageable, uh, to make it something that a, a busy cardiac uh, healthcare provider could remember in their daily practice. Uh, and we came up with this. So when to suspect cardiac amyloidosis? Suspected in patients who have new onset heart failure, 
uh, that's not attributable to another cause uh, who have one or more of the following things. So unexplained LV wall thickness. So I, I, I kind of always try to make this point uh, to my fellows, uh, particularly in the echo lab, that if a patient has a thick heart, we really owe them an explanation. We need to at least try to understand why their heart is thick. Most of the time it's due to comorbidities like hypertension uh, or renal dysfunction, but we need to keep an eye out uh, for the zebras as well. Uh, another feature is low flow, low grade aortic stenosis, which I talked about. Um, here's an important one, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, often bilateral. Um, almost all of my patients with transthyretin amyloidosis have or have had carpal tunnel syndrome at some point in the past. And sometimes, uh, in fact, often, it can be the canary in the mine shaft for patients, uh, whereby it presents many years, sometimes five, uh, sometimes even more, uh, prior to uh, cardiac uh, presentation. Uh, and it's the earliest manifestation uh, of their transthyretin amyloidosis. Um, and you have to ask about this because sometimes it's not as much of a problem anymore for patients if they've had it fixed in the last couple of years uh, and they don't think to mention it uh, to their heart doctor, uh, but it can be a very important uh, tip off that they may have amyloidosis. And we do see it in the patients with AL as well. Another important extracardiac one is peripheral neuropathy, so numbness and tingling in the hands and feet, loss of position or temperature sensation, uh, very common, particularly in some types of the hereditary ATTR, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we do see it a little bit uh, in the other types as well. Um, and also autonomic dysfunction. Autonomic dysfunction is very common across all of these types and a host of different autonomic dysfunction manifestations. Uh, often uh, hypotension, uh, particularly orthostatic, but also things like gastrointestinal dysfunction, um, uh, sexual dysfunction, all of these things uh, are, are mani potential manifestations. Uh, and then the last feature we point out, which is kind of obvious, but we, we want to emphasize its importance is patients with established AL or ATTR amyloidosis in a different organ system uh, who do not have known cardiac involvement uh, may be at risk for developing cardiac involvement uh, in the future. And so always think about the heart uh, when these two conditions present themselves um, because there is a good chance that uh, the heart will be involved. Okay, so moving on to diagnostic evaluation. So the, the typical tests that we use, I'll, I'll kind of go through them one at a time and then present uh, an algorithm. Uh, so troponin and BNP are important tests. Uh, both of them are chronically elevated. Um, the BNP in particular is often elevated way out of proportion to what you might expect for the degree of clinical heart failure. I've been asked, what does that mean, way out of proportion? And we don't actually have a good definition for that. Uh, we're working on that. Um, but if it kind of catches you off guard in the non-scientific way of uh, saying it, like, wow, that's quite a high uh, BNP, uh, then think about um, amyloidosis. Uh, both of these tests uh, are, are chronically elevated. Um, troponin uh, is often uh, higher for patients with AL because of that myotoxic effect of the light chains that I mentioned before. And sometimes that leads them down the path of uh, workup for coronary artery disease. Uh, both of them have uh, prognostic, important prognostic value as well. Uh, and in fact, uh, for AL amyloidosis uh, are kind of directly influenced uh, their management. ECG, ECG is uh, a helpful test in some patients, but often not helpful um, because uh, the, the findings, the classic findings that you see in the textbook uh, have a low diagnostic yield uh, and uh, are often um, not present. And the findings overall are nonspecific. The classic findings are low voltage, particularly in the limb leads, uh, pseudo infarct pattern, uh, atrial arrhythmia, typically AFib, conduction system disease of all kinds of flavors, uh, and ventricular ectopy. Um, so I like to say that you know if, if the ECG is helpful, that's great, but you really can't rely on it very much. Uh, and sometimes it can it can throw you a curveball. So I have lots of patients who actually have LVH uh, on their ECG. Uh, because they've had a lifetime of hypertension, most commonly, uh, and that's caused uh, LVH, uh, and then they've only developed amyloidosis uh, more recently. 
Uh, so uh, it, can, it can sometimes be uh, a challenging test to interpret uh, in these patients. One point that uh, I, I probably can't mention enough and, and always emphasize again and again uh, is the importance of, of screening for AL amyloidosis. So um, in a lot of patients who are older, uh, who kind of fit the bill for transthyretin amyloidosis, uh, this can sometimes be forgotten. Um, but it's an important uh, test to, it's important to screen for AL amyloidosis in all patients because uh, I've learned, and I think many of us uh, who see a lot of these patients have learned uh, that it, AL can be a very sneaky disease um, and often it, it presents rapidly with a rapid deterioration, but not always. Um, so before you do anything, as soon as you think of, of amyloidosis, you have to screen for this. And how do we do that? Uh, well, we do serum and urine protein uh, electrophoresis. Now, this tends to have a lower sensitivity for AL uh, because the light chains are very small and they don't always uh, make a, a mark in the, in the electrophoresis gel. And so we really emphasize the need for immunofixation. Uh, that can be challenging to get, particularly in Calgary because it's, it's labor intensive and a lot of labs uh, don't like to do it. Uh, so often you have to ask for it. Um, and the other important test is a, a free light chain assay, a serum free light chain assay. Uh, and this tests for kappa or lambda free light chains uh, in the serum. And the important finding is that one of these is elevated and the other is relatively preserved. And so either you have a high uh, or a low ratio. This test can be difficult to interpret, um, especially if you're not a hematologist, which uh, none of us are, um, because a lot of things can throw it off. And so renal dysfunction is probably the most common one. Uh, and this tends to cause an elevation uh, in both uh, kappa and lambda light chains. Uh, uh, so the values are higher, but the ratio is preserved. Uh, there's also this entity monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance where you have a high kappa or a lambda, um, but it's not, it's kind of a benign precursor. So it's not causing uh, any organ dysfunction or disease yet. Um, this is actually quite common in patients with ATTR. There's kind of a proven association. I think it's because um, it's very common with age in general, and we just look for it more often in this population. Um, and these patients require surveillance, actually. They need to be monitored. Their light chains are monitored year after year. Uh, and uh, the cancer center has an MGUS clinic dedicated to this. So as I mentioned, these can be challenging tests to interpret, and I don't think uh, as cardiovascular care providers we're expected to know um, and that uh, just emphasizes the need to have good relations with our, our hematologists, uh, refer or ask uh, if you're uncertain, uh, and I, I do this on a regular basis, but it is important to screen for. So yeah, moving on to the imaging. So ECHO is, is probably the test where amyloidosis uh, is first kind of seriously considered um, uh, or, uh, or uh, emphasized. Uh, and the classic findings are increased wall thickness uh, of typically both ventricles, uh, often the atria are enlarged uh, and may be thick as well. The valves are thick, the interatrial septum's thick, everything's thick because of the amyloid infiltration. Some patients may have a small pericardial fusion. These are all nonspecific findings as well. Uh, and they don't, and they can happen uh, commonly in other diseases. Uh, there's a technique uh, strain imaging, which is a little more sensitive measure uh, of contractile function. Uh, and patients with, who have amyloidosis have a more um, specific strain pattern whereby it's reduced in the, uh, the basal and the mid segments, uh, but preserved in the apex. Um, that can also be seen in other diseases, but it's, it's relatively more specific for amyloidosis and can certainly point you in the right direction uh, if it's done. Um, so that goes an important test, but I think the important part also to emphasize is you're kind of, you're very rarely done with echo. Uh, usually you need to go on to do more uh, tests uh, uh, even when that strain pattern is present. Cardiac MRI is a very valuable test and, and these lovely pictures uh, are, are courtesy of James. Um, uh, the, probably the workhorse uh, for detecting amyloidosis is uh, gadolinium, late gadolinium enhancement imaging. Uh, and the characteristic patterns are a diffuse subendocardial pattern as you see there on the bottom right. Uh, 
uh, often involving the right ventricle as well, or just a diffuse transmural pattern and just the, uh, there's enhancement throughout the heart uh, caused by the amyloid infiltration. However, we know that uh, patients, particularly with ATTR, may have other patterns as well. Uh, and so uh, you can't hang your hat on that. Uh, and uh, you, know, you need to have a high index of suspicion uh, for patients who, who may have other uh, findings um, on their MRI, but more typical clinical manifestations. Uh, T1 mapping uh, is proving to be a very valuable tool as well, um, particularly uh, post contrast with extracellular volume quantification, uh, which may have a role in uh, surveillance for the AL type for patients on chemotherapy. And uh, that story uh, is still in evolution. But um, like ECHO, MRI can't differentiate subtype. So it doesn't, doesn't tell you whether they have AL or ATTR. Um, and like ECHO, it can be fooled and, and you need to, um, you're never done with the MRI as well. You generally need to go on and do further testing to determine what type they have. So uh, the tests and the development that uh, probably made the biggest impact on how we find these patients and care for them um, is uh, nuclear scintigraphy with technetium 99M pyrophosphate. So pyrophosphate's been around forever. Uh, it's the test that we used to use to detect uh, MIs. Um, but uh, we've known about this association that it, it has a very nice uptake for patients with transthyretin amyloidosis. Um, and this has now given us uh, an ability to diagnose transthyretin amyloidosis without a biopsy, uh, non-invasively, which has really expanded our ability to detect these patients uh, in the community. And so there's different ways of grading this uptake. One is a, a visual grade. If it's um, greater than uh, surrounding bone uh, in the heart, uh, then that's a positive result. Uh, or there's a region of interest kind of counts assessment uh, whereby if the, the uptake is 1.5 times uh, that of the, the lung uh, zone on the other side, then that's positive. Uh, SPECT is very important here um, because uh, it, it improves the diagnostic accuracy of this test by localizing uh, the uptake to the myocardium. Sometimes if you just do the planar scans, uh, you can get fooled by blood pool uptake. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it's still an important detail is that before you do this test, you have to rule out AL uh, because uh, these patients, um, ATTR patients uh, are the ones that are positive, but some AL patients actually have a bit of uptake as well. Um, and so those are uh, still another point to emphasize. And so given that we've made all this progress with uh, non-invasive assessment, what's the role of cardiac biopsy? Um, well, there's two main roles for it. One is patients with AL still need a tissue diagnosis in order to go on to get uh, chemotherapy. Um, and so we need to show it somewhere in the tissue. Uh, and so often that's in the bone marrow, but sometimes it's not present or, or not sufficient in the bone marrow. And, um, you know, we may do a kidney biopsy or we may do a heart biopsy uh, to prove that the patients uh, actually have AL amyloidosis. Uh, and if they do, the, the classic finding, which has changed in decades, is, is using Congo red uh, stain, uh, which when you shine polarized, uh, shine it under polarized light, has this nice green, apple green birefringence pattern. The other setting where uh, biopsy is important is if you have equivocal non-invasive test results. Um, and as pyrophosphate scanning proliferates uh, into more and more communities and more and more laboratories, and we're beginning to see that, that the diagnostic accuracy maybe wasn't quite as high as we saw in initial results from kind of high referral, um, high volume referral centers. Um, and so there are more and more patients um, who we see with kind of borderline or equivocal testing that we need to do uh, biopsies on. Uh, and then the final point is genetic testing. So patients uh, with ATTR may either have the wild type uh, or the hereditary type. Uh, the wild type is far more common uh, in Canada in particular, um, but we stressed in the guidelines that genetic testing is still important and we emphasized it for all of our patients for a few reasons. One is that uh, it may influence prognosis. Um, it may also uh, influence uh, our suspicion for multi-organ uh, involvement, particularly some of the hereditary types of uh, much more neuropathy or other uh, system involvement. 
Uh, of course, it has implications for family screening. Uh, and as I'll talk about in a minute, it has uh, important implications um, for eligibility for different uh, disease modifying therapies. So we do recommend that. So here is the diagnostic algorithm that we uh, presented uh, in the guideline document. And it looks like a lot on first glance, but actually it's it's pretty straightforward. And so, you know, if you suspect cardiac amyloidosis based on a standard workup for heart failure, which um, will typically include imaging, uh, may include MRI, um, then the next step is to screen for AL amyloidosis, screen for monoclonal protein uh, using uh, the tests, the electrophoresis and light chain assay that I described earlier. And if that's positive, then you go down this green path here and you have to rule out AL amyloidosis. And generally your next step is to refer to a hematologist uh, and do so quickly um, because this is a malignancy that can progress quite rapidly. And they'll typically do uh, one or more biopsies. They'll often do a bone marrow biopsy, uh, sometimes uh, a fat biopsy, and, and they may or may not recommend renal or cardiac biopsies. Um, and if patients have it, then they may need treatment for it, of course. Uh, you may exclude cardiac amyloidosis, or you may go to the other path, the pink path here, um, which you would do if they don't have monoclonal protein present, which is uh, if ATTR is suspected. And then your next step is the nuclear scintigraphy scan if it's available. Uh, and if that's positive, then you need to go on and do genetic testing. Uh, if that's equivocal, um, then uh, you may do a biopsy. Uh, and if it's negative, then you, you've ruled it out. So it's actually pretty straightforward uh, and easy to follow, we, we think. Okay, so moving on to uh, management. So this figure from the guidelines uh, just illustrates that uh, there are now two pathways uh, that for both diseases, ATTR and AL amyloidosis, uh, that are important to, to follow in parallel. One is management of their cardiac problems, uh, and the other is disease-modifying therapy uh, for both AL and ATTR. I'll go into more detail on that in the next couple of minutes. So managing their cardiac problems is really mostly symptom control. And, and for patients with ATTR for many years, this was all we could do for them. Uh, and so there are a number of things that you can do to help these patients uh, feel better. Um, probably one of the first things I do when I see a patient with amyloidosis is I begin reducing and sometimes stopping some of their medications, uh, which may not be helpful. Uh, patients often tolerate beta blockers very poorly. Uh, and they've been put on a beta blocker either in the past or because uh, they have heart failure and it's thought that that may be helpful, um, but often it, it just exacerbates their symptoms. Uh, same for calcium channel blockers, uh, as well as many vasodilators like ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Uh, digoxin is more of a historical contraindication. It's, it's probably not as bad as we used to think it is, but it also probably doesn't help very much. Um, sometimes patients need these medications, and if they do, they can be used, but they should be used with caution. Uh, diuresis is still the mainstay of therapy, uh, or at least uh, symptom control for many patients. Um, and uh, the majority of patients uh, need uh, di maintenance diuresis. Uh, atrial fibrillation and, and flutter, uh, often a, a very common problem, can sometimes be difficult to manage. Um, Patients who have it need anticoagulation, regardless of what their you know, calculated CHADS, VASC, or other uh, risk scores are for um, thromboembolic events. Um, they have, these patients have very sticky and um, rubbery endocardium, which is very thrombogenic. Uh, and so if they have atrial arrhythmia uh, and, and amyloidosis, then they should be anticoagulated. I often use one of the direct oral anticoagulants. There's really no, no guidance there um, or evidence to support uh, one choice over another of anticoagulants, although these patients are prone to bleeding, which is kind of why I like the, the direct oral anticoagulants. Um, an important point, which I'll point out in a minute, is that if they're getting cardioversion, uh, even if they've been on adequate anticoagulation duration um, and therapeutically, uh, I'll always do a TE before electrical cardioverting uh, because these patients can still develop thrombus um, even uh, with anticoagulation. Uh, patients I've mentioned often have conduction system disease. We use standard 
uh, indications for uh, pacemaker implantation. Uh, what we don't use standard indications for uh, is um, ICD implantation. Uh, majority of patients have preserved ejection fraction, but uh, some of them have reduced ejection fraction, but there is evidence to suggest that their benefit is, is less um, from an ICD, even if they have an EF reduced for primary prevention. Um, and uh, often these patients uh, die of um, electromechanical dissociation as opposed to BF. Um, and so we, we generally stick to secondary prevention in those patients. Um, you know, we've gotten better at selecting patients for heart transplant. It's still very rare that uh, they'll, they'll go for heart transplant because of all of their other medical problems. Um, but modern data suggests that with more better selection criteria, they can do well. The role of, of ventricular assist devices is pretty unclear. I don't think most centers uh, do that. So here's some data from uh, the Mayo Clinic, uh, just talking further about atrial fibrillation and, and how to manage it. Um, let's say that uh, a higher proportion of patients have uh, unsuccessful cardioversions, although the majority still have successful cardioversions when it's indicated. Um, but the bottom uh, pie charts here kind of demonstrate that the key finding is, is the, the, the prevalence of intracardiac thrombus in these patients uh, is much higher than um, the standard population with AFib. Uh, and so hence the uh, recommendation to do a TE uh, in all patients prior to cardioverting. Okay, so moving on to disease modifying therapy. Uh, this is, uh, there's been a lot of developments uh, in, in chemotherapy and stem cell transplant for patients with AL. I'm not gonna go into that in, in any detail, um, except to say that patients are living longer with AL. It's not as dire uh, a diagnosis as it used to be. Um, it, patients are still very sick, uh, and unfortunately, many of them still do, don't respond, but the majority uh, actually have much better outcomes, uh, and some of them will go into remission um, and uh, either be cured by a stem cell transplant uh, or require chronic um, maintenance chemotherapy, that, that actually have very good quality of lives. Uh, so that's an important point um, uh, to emphasize, uh, particularly when patients are first diagnosed uh, and they go on the internet and see very kind of dire, dire data about uh, their prognosis. Um, but looking back at, at ATTR, I showed a version of this uh, cascade earlier, uh, and there's been a, a number of agents that have been uh, come into approval and more are in development. The two main types or categories are um, silencers uh, of TTR, which uh, shut down production uh, of uh, TTR protein uh, in the liver. And there's two main agents, ionotercin and patisseran that uh, are approved for that. Uh, and then tefamidus, which is a stabilizer, which binds to the, the TTR tetramer and prevents it from dissociating, um, is kind of the, the big news uh, in the cardiac world uh, because it's been uh, shown to improve outcomes for patients with cardiomyopathy. So uh, Tefamidus, a uh, bit more on it. So the, the ATTRACT trial was kind of the, the, uh, the seminal paper that came out uh, a couple of years ago, um, which showed that patients uh, with ATTR cardiomyopathy lived longer and stayed out of hospital more uh, on Tefamidus than without. Uh, the curves began to separate at about 18 months. Um, and uh, the criteria, uh, other than patients with severe disease was, was pretty liberal, patients with class one to three uh, NYHA class one to three symptoms uh, were included. Uh, subgroup analysis showed that the patients who perhaps derive the most benefit are the ones in early stage disease. And that's not really surprising. That's a, a feature of um, most infiltrative disorders is, is you get to it early before uh, the infiltration becomes too far gone and, and irreversible. Um, Tefamis is approved uh, by Health Canada. Uh, it's been approved for a, a number of months. Um, it's quite an expensive drug. It's, uh, in the United States, it was the most expensive uh, drug for uh, cardiovascular indications uh, ever released. Um, and so, and so the uh, public coverage negotiations are still ongoing uh, across Canada. There are a few private payers uh, that cover it, um, but it is uh, still a challenging uh, uh, drug uh, to get access to, and hopefully that will improve over time. The two other drugs that I mentioned, the, the silencers, the one that uh, shut down production of the TTR protein in the liver, um, are both 
approved, but only for patients with neuropathy, the hereditary type, not the wild type, uh, who have neuropathy. And they are inotercin and patisseran. Uh, they have very similar mechanisms of action. Uh, and both of the, the uh, clinical trials were neuropathy trials, uh, looking at attenuating progression of their neuropathy symptoms. Uh, and you see the results, uh, both of them published in the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, by the way. Similarly, they're both uh, approved in Canada. Um, access to them is also difficult uh, because of their cost and uh, public coverage negotiations uh, are underway for both of them. Um, they've both been looked at for cardiac uh, and uh, have both shown to have some potential cardiac benefits, particularly patisseran, um, but haven't been proven yet uh, uh, being actively studied in clinical trials as we speak. Uh, and so perhaps they will um, become approved for cardiac indications as well or their, their next generation um, cousin agents. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of activity that's going on in this uh, field. It's really uh, amazing that this disease has uh, so many drugs that are being investigated uh, and coming to approval uh, all around the same time. So there's a number of silencers uh, that are being investigated for cardiac indications. Uh, and I've listed a few of them there. Uh, there's another stabilizer uh, that's being uh, tested in phase three clinical trials right now to compete with tefaminis. Uh, there are other options for degraders uh, or inhibitors, which kind of try to prevent or clear out deposits uh, in the heart and other tissues. And so just a very active area with a lot of clinical trials uh, that are going on. Uh, and it's hard to keep up with all of them, to be honest. And so this rapid shift of the landscape and this evolution of the area uh, has created a, a number of questions, uh, which uh, are very much uh, unanswered to this date uh, and need to be answered, important questions um, that uh, we're exploring and a lot of groups are exploring. Uh, and so just to list a few of them, uh, current gaps in knowledge are, what do you do with the patients who have uh, a mixture of cardiac and neuro symptoms, right? Do you put them on to famitis for their heart, or do you put them on inotercin or patisseran, which is approved for their nerves? Well, the truth is we don't really know. Um, we've got all, all groups, including uh, the guidelines, have adopted kind of a common sense approach is where, where you treat the, the biggest, what you think is the biggest problem. So if it's a heart, that's the main issue, then you try to treat them with defamitis. If it's the neuropathy, that's their main problem and they have the gene mutation, uh, then you treat them with the other two agents. Um, but this is still, you know, unproven and uninvestigated. Perhaps a, a, a very important uh, knowledge gap is, is how to monitor these patients moving forward now that we have treatments. We don't really have good definitions for disease, uh, for disease fail or treatment failure, pardon me, um, and disease progression on therapy. All of them are meant to attenuate disease progression. They're all meant to kind of pause uh, the disease from progressing and, and, and stabilize things and keep things from getting worse. So if the patient stays the same, you can define that as treatment success. But how do you define a treatment failure and what extent and what markers do you use to define that? And when do you switch? Uh, and when more options are available, which agent do you start with? All of these are unanswered questions, uh, which will need to uh, get a handle on uh, moving forward. And then, of course, the availability of therapies, I mentioned that a little bit, uh, a challenging uh, area, which will hopefully improve as prices come down over time and more therapies become available. So in the last couple of minutes, I just want to talk a little bit about um, uh, models for best care uh, and practice, uh, and also uh, what's going on in the local and national amyloid community and, and how we're trying to improve uh, knowledge translation. So this is a bit of a, a rehash, um, but just to kind of reiterate some of the challenges that caring for patients with this disease uh, presents. Um, historically, there's been a low awareness among healthcare providers. Uh, and I think that's understandable, especially when there are no therapies that are available and the disease is perceived as rare with a very poor prognosis. Um, but none of those things are true anymore, actually, uh, for the majority of patients. Um, and awareness has improved significantly over time. Uh, we've made a lot of progress uh, in the cardiovascular community, uh, which has just been you know, really exciting to, to witness. And we're trying to, uh, as well as the neurology community, 
Uh, and we're trying to expand that uh, to other uh, healthcare providers and specialists as well, internal medicine and family medicine. Um, so we still need to work on that, but there's been a lot of improvement. Uh, the nonspecific signs and symptoms, the challenges with diagnostic workup, I already mentioned that. Uh, the fact that multiple specialists are involved and who's driving the bus and, and who's kind of guiding uh, disease modifying therapy, especially, that's important. Um, the specialized tests that I mentioned earlier, access to them may not be uh, universal across centers uh, in Canada and elsewhere. Um, and that's kind of a, a barrier that we're facing in different areas. Uh, and then these patients uh, are often, especially early on in their, in their disease course, maybe a uh, high needs population uh, to address. They require a lot of time, a lot of resources to care for them. Uh, and of course, we're all strapped for all of those things. And so I like to say that looking after an amyloidosis patient, it takes a village uh, and it really does. There's a lot of, of people that are involved in their workup uh, and caring for them. I've already talked about some of the differences between these two different diseases, AL and ATTR. Um, they look very similar at the beginning, but their management can be quite different and their, their course can be quite different. Uh, and that needs to be figured out very early on uh, so that, um, uh, their outcome can be as good as possible. But, uh, you know, beyond the, the hematologist that primarily manages AL and the cardiologist or the neurologist that primarily manage ATTR, there's a lot of other uh, specialists that are involved due to the multi-system nature of this disease. So in recognition of that, uh, our center and a lot of centers, uh, uh, especially now um, uh, are forming dedicated groups uh, and programs uh, to look after the amyloid patient. And in Calgary, we form the, the Calgary Amyloid Working Group uh, or the COG. Uh, and this has been active for about a year, a little bit more. Um, it's still a work in progress. The group is still development and developing. There's a lot of living members uh, who participate. We are open to anyone joining, actually, uh, and anyone is welcome to join our meetings and uh, be a part of the group. But it's a multidisciplinary group of specialists uh, who are dedicated to caring to amyloidosis patients. Um, and probably the main activity that we do is to try to standardize care pathways for diagnosis and management, uh, uh, employing treatment uh, and diagnostic algorithms that work best in Calgary. Um, uh, so that patients can get access to care and delivering uh, therapeutics, both in clinical trials as well as novel therapeutics uh, is an important goal as well. Uh, and we engage in other academic activities, education and research. We have uh, monthly multidisciplinary rounds. We have educational events. We just had our second amyloidosis day uh, in October, annual amyloidosis day, which was actually quite a nice success. We had uh, participants from over 10 countries uh, uh, globally um, and uh, some very kind of high profile keynote speakers. And on the right there, you see a list of uh, all of the different uh, subspecialties uh, that are involved. And so this is the, the, the workup care pathway that we are striving towards. Uh, not many of these pieces are in place, uh, not all of them. Um, uh, but to kind of emphasize what the point I made earlier, kind of a key early step is to figure out which subtype they have AL versus ATTR so that they can be directed uh, to the most appropriate specialty who's going to lead their disease modifying therapy. And as mentioned for ATTR, that's either a cardiologist, a neurologist or both. Uh, and for AL, that's a hematologist. Of course, there may be consultation among those groups. Um, but really, we've divided this into levels of care. Uh, and so the next level would be kind of in green there, which is specialist consult uh, and managing all of their disease complications. Uh, and then the next level is for those who have advanced or even end stage care. And then an important part of their journey uh, are these other specialties along the left here in blue, nursing, pharmacy, social work, uh, and others uh, who play a, a very important role uh, throughout. And so here are the pillars uh, uh, that we kind of strive towards uh, in the amyloid uh, working group. Uh, of course, the patient's in the center, um, but we uh, focus on uh, these four things of so care and developing pathways and doing quality assessment research, you know, um, facilitating clinical trial participation and other 
um, national and, and local um, initiatives. Uh, advocacy, especially with uh, drugs that cost this much, is an important part. Uh, and working with our, our patients, uh, as well as with government and industry uh, to help improve access. And then, of course, education uh, with different uh, events, such as uh, rounds and uh, specialized CME events. Uh, and then just in the last minute, so uh, other active uh, things that are going on include uh, the registry, the Canadian Re Registry for Amyloidosis Research, or CRAR. Uh, this uh, is a multi-center registry uh, uh, across Canada. It's multidisciplinary, and so we have uh, significant involvement from uh, not just cardiologists, but neurologists and hematologists, as well as others as well, including patient partners. Um, and this will hopefully answer a lot of those knowledge gaps uh, that we've talked about uh, in Canada. Of course, I mentioned uh, guideline development and uh, we, the cardiology guidelines are published. Uh, neurology guidelines in Canada are uh, soon to be published uh, and are in review. Um, and uh, these are all important efforts towards building our amyloidosis community in Canada. Um, okay, so that's the end. Uh, so yeah, to conclude, uh, we've had a lot of advancements uh, in amyloid and I've, I haven't talked about all of them, uh, but I've tried to touch on the major ones uh, and still a very active field um, and an exciting field to, to be in uh, at this time. Um, but it still comes down to a high index of clinical suspicion and keeping it in mind and thinking about it as an important uh, uh, key element uh, to recognizing it, especially early. Um, ongoing uh, development of new therapies uh, hold promise for patients uh, for improving outcomes even further in the future, uh, but we still have a lot of work to do, still have a lot of gaps, and I've talked about some of the initiatives both locally and across Canada, uh, and there are others around the world that are trying to address those. So thanks very much for your participation. Uh, I realize I've been shamefully ignoring the chat box, um, and so... I can either open this up to uh, questions from the group uh, or uh, I can just kind of read out some of these uh, comments. Uh, Carlos, is there a preference uh, to which I do or? Um, no, that's fine. I think there's some comments there in the, in yeah. the chat that are worth uh, answering. Yeah. Uh, well, I can, I can kind of... Uh, quarterback these. Uh, so I'll, I'll pick it up from uh, the, the, the Spanish architect. So uh, Andy was asking about if it's not hypertension or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's not amyloidosis. What is your most likely uh, uh, diagnosis on the differential? Well, you know, there's rare infiltrative disorders um, that I can certainly talk a lot about, like Fabry's disease and you know, other, other, that's kind of relatively more prevalent in our part of the world, uh, although it's still exceedingly rare um, and, you know, kind of getting down into the zebras. You know, most of the time, you know, if it's not hypertension, a lot of the times it's, it's just um, advanced kidney disease. Those patients tend to have thick hearts. Um, but if you've ruled out those things, then you're, you're on a, a, a bit of a fishing expedition. Um, and, you know, that's, that's um, a challenge, I think, for another talk. I hope, hopefully that answers your question correctly. Um, Carlos, you had asked about combination therapy. Yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, so there are different categories, right? Uh, there's silencers, there's stabilizers. Um, uh, at the moment, that's generally an approach that is, uh, I haven't encouraged, and I think other kind of people who live in this world haven't encouraged, mainly because of the cost. You know, when you're talking about therapies, uh, uh, you know, Tofaminus has been listed at upwards of $200,000 a year. Some of the other silencers are more than that. Um, I think, and my hope is that over time, yes, you know, those will become more realistic options uh, that will need to be explored, especially uh, as we look at, um, you know, patients who may have refractory disease to different types. Um, I suspect that that's uh, several years off, um, but maybe in the future, this will become like, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, where we use, you know, multi, uh, tool, multiple tools for disease modifying therapy. Um, but that story is still, you know, very much in its early stages. Um, yeah, and mostly because, the company, you know, there's some neurologic uh, alterations that actually predict prognosis. So if you do combined therapy, maybe yeah. you improve the overall survival. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, 
what's important, especially now while the therapies are expensive is, you know, how much incremental benefit are we getting? You know, so if we use, you know, a silencer and we knock down most of the TTR production, you know, is there added benefit to stabilizing what we don't knock down or are we kind of adding a lot of cost um, without much benefit? You know, certainly they're intuitively very attractive, um, but we, st we still have a lot to learn about that. Um, the stabilizers for now are very well tolerated, they're almost free of, of any side effects. So that's a good thing. So a few things you have to watch for for the um, silencers. Um, but I think just, yeah, the bottom line is uh, we need to address these uh, questions uh, moving forward. Um, Andy, yeah, you go on to mention Fabrace, so you were reading my mind, that's great. Uh, uh, Brian uh, asked about uh, coverage. Um, uh, so yeah, Blue Cross doesn't cover any of these uh, yet. Um, the, uh, all of these, uh, uh, in particular to FAMIS, but all of these agents are able to work with patients through support programs to help uh, those who may have private coverage. And there is some private coverage that's available uh, to help patients uh, kind of navigate that directly and help us, the care providers, uh, do that. Um, again, that's still early days and we're hopeful that uh, public coverage will, will be coming through in the next few months, um, but we'll just have to wait and see and it's gonna look different from one province to another. Um, any specific, I don't know how much time, I'm not really, we're already at nine. Do you want me to keep going here or, or, or shut up? <laughs> uh, I, I got to run to AF Clinic, but you guys can keep going if you want. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just keep going here. And if, uh, if, if people need to, to run away and go to other places, I want to thank you everyone for your attention and participating and uh, for the opportunity to present. And yeah, I'll just keep going down the list here of uh, chat box comments and questions. Thanks, Carlos. Um, Great presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, any specific side effects of tefaminus to be aware of? Uh, is this a lifelong therapy? Yeah, great question. So uh, really, no, tefaminus is extremely well tolerated. Um, and we haven't really seen much in the way of side effects. We don't really monitor uh, for anything specifically. Um, and I've got about 50 patients who are on it. Uh, most of them were enrolled through an open label extension study. A few of them will be kind of initiating through commercial uh, product uh, in the next little while. Um, and yes, it is intended to be a lifelong therapy um, as a stabilization, you know. So patients can progress, um, uh, you know, most of them, you know, tefaminus is very effective. Um, but, you know, a lot of these patients are older and they may have other comorbidities that progress. And so, you know, we still don't have a good uh, sense as to when to stop therapy uh, as well. It's an important consideration. When's a patient uh, too sick to be on a therapy uh, like this, especially when it's well tolerated. Uh, some of the other, um, the other two uh, agents, the silencers, we do have to monitor for a couple things. Patients on inotercin, we have to monitor their platelets primarily. Uh, patients on patisseran, generally we, we watch them for uh, transfusion reactions because that's an IV medication. In general, though, both are, are pretty well tolerated and also intended to be lifelong therapies, right? Um, so that's an important part of this story that we're still uh, understanding better. Uh, someone had a question about uh, peripheral uh, blood cell uh, transplantation. So, um, uh, I think probably that's asking about what type of uh, stem cell transplant uh, do these patients get? So they get an autologous uh, stem cell transplantation. And so uh, they get their stem cell transplants, har stem cell harvested, and then and they undergo uh, intense chemotherapy uh, to try to eradicate the disease and then get um, uh, autologous uh, stem cell transplant uh, from what was, was harvested. And uh, not all patients are a candidate for that. It's, it's, it's a lot to go through. And so, you know, patients who are older and frailer or have a lot of comorbidities may not be, um, um, you know, eligible for it. Um, but even those who don't, some may have a very favorable response to chemo without it. Um, but hopefully I've answered your question describing uh, stem cell transplantation. Um, Kristen could ask me if I could re-emphasize that pyrophosphate scans for negative, equivocal, and positive, um, uh, yeah, may, you may get alternate uh, reports other than positive and negative. Um, uh, 
I've had experience where scans being reported as positive despite the ratio not being over 1.5. Yeah, so uh, this is, um, you know, we, we're very, I'm very fortunate. We have great uh, nuclear cardiology and nuclear medicine support in Calgary um, with uh, Rob and the group, as well as uh, Denise Chen in nuclear medicine. Uh, and Rob has gone on to, I think, address that. But, you know, the test is, is, is an excellent test, but it's not infallible. Uh, SPECT is, is very important. Uh, and I think we're understanding this more and more, just how important SPECT is to really localize that uptake, uh, even if the ratios that I reported are, are not quite, you know, kind of in the positive zone. Uh, you may still have patients uh, who are positive uh, and that's where that expertise comes in. Rob, hopefully I'm not kind of uh, saying anything too offensive here. Um, and also kind of the false positives, right? Uh, which is often um, improved by SPECT imaging. Most of those are due to blood pool uptake uh, and SPECT is very helpful at localizing that uptake uh, to the myocardium as suggests the blood pool. Uh, uh, here's a question. There was an amyloid patient given a heart transplant about 20 years ago and it came back. Uh, does it always come back? Well, that's uh, interesting. Um, and, you know, to expand on that a, a little further, um, well, the answer is, is we don't know. You know, it certainly can come back, uh, regardless of which type they have, it can come back. Um, for patients who had the hereditary type, uh, because they have a mutant protein that's made in the liver, uh, for many patients, the cure uh, was actually to give them a liver transplant. And that was mostly used for patients with nerve problems because patients with heart problems often were too sick to get uh, a liver transplant. But some patients um, with heart involvement would get a heart and a liver transplant. Uh, and a lot of those patients, yeah, we did actually see that it did come back in their heart. Didn't fully understand that. There are other organs that make the protein. Uh, so that may have been a source for the mutant protein. And we also think that, um, you know, they may just be more susceptible to deposition. Um, but we don't, we don't the, like I said, we don't know because we don't do a lot of transplants and liver transplant uh, is going away because of these new therapies, uh, fortunately, I think, uh, that are much more successful. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, uh, that story, we're still understanding it. And there's such a small number of patients as well, that it, it's difficult to make definitive comments. Um, oh, okay. Well, Deb corrected, uh, Lisa saying that was uh, actually a sarcoid, the other osis patient. Um, but, uh, hopefully my comments, uh, were still helpful. <laughs> okay. Carlos is reminding everybody, uh, and, um, that uh, to be confidential. Uh, thanks for uh, all the comments. Uh, Jonathan, is it worth mentioning liver transplant? Yep, you read my mind, great comment. Um, I have uh, a few minutes uh, here, so I'm, I'm happy to entertain any questions either you know, through the chat box uh, or you know, if you just wanna come off mute and ask, I'm happy to for whoever's left. Uh, and if you gotta run, uh, again, thanks uh, for, for uh, joining in. Okay, well, it looks, looks like uh, there's no questions and, um, you know, in which case uh, I'll, I'll probably will sign off, uh, but thanks again, everyone for uh, tuning in um, and certainly feel free to reach out to me by email or, or however you like, uh, if you have other thoughts and, uh, you know, for, for those um, who are interested in uh, joining our, our working group in Calgary, uh, just reach out to me. Uh, we'd be delighted to have you. Okay. Have a good day, everyone. All the best.